Welcome to Conquering Your Clownfish, a podcast dedicated to transforming disabilities into special abilities. I'm your host, Brady Murray. Welcome back to the podcast. Great to have you here. So excited to be able to jump into this episode and explore more on this concept of turning special needs into special abilities. Today, we're going to be visiting more so around why this is so important. So I shared in episode one how guilty as charged, I raise my hand in saying oftentimes I am the biggest problem or biggest challenge for my boys who've been entrusted with a special ability to realize their full potential and sing the song that they're meant to sing. But let's be honest, there's also many challenges that we face as, love, as uh, families, as parents, as caretakers of individuals who have special abilities outside influences. One of the biggest ones that I experience myself is in the school districts. In fact, tomorrow I have an IEP, much anticipated IEP with the school district for my, let's see, Ridge would be a seventh grader. That's going to be a unique experience because this actually is the first IEP for our son and he's in seventh grade. So I'll share that in another episode. But we know school districts trying to have inclusion, that's a big challenge. Workplace is a challenge trying to be able to get opportunities for our our loved ones that have special abilities to be able to get into the world, into the workplace, to be able to work and gain, uh, be gainfully employed. That's a challenge. But if we look back, we have come a long ways. If you go back, I actually love studying this. I love watching documentaries and I love hearing people's stories about what life was like back in the day, if you may, of individuals who were entrusted with a special ability and more importantly, what was it like for their families and really like to understand what that perception is or what that, that reality is. In fact, Andrea and I have a personal experience with this. As we shared, we welcomed our beautiful boy into this world in 2007 and found out that he has Down syndrome. We embraced this with all of our hearts and we leaned into it as much as we could. I would say if we were going to get a tattoo, we would get a Down syndrome rocks tattoo. I think that's awesome. Like we love everything about Down syndrome and it's because we have fully embraced this community and fully dove into it. And not just Down syndrome, but all things special abilities. We are big, big fans of this. It was through uh, uh, this involvement that Andrea and I founded our nonprofit organization, Rod's Heroes, that inspires families to answer the call to adopt a child with special abilities or other unique circumstances. And it was actually through this that we ultimately have adopted our son, Cooper, who has Down syndrome from China. And that's an episode for another day. But it was after a number of years. And so we've probably been in this community for a good, man, I'd say 10, 12, and almost 13 years when we were at a family gathering and Andrea's aunt came up to Andrea and said, Hey, did you know that we have a great, I believe great, great uncle who has Down syndrome? And Andrea looked at her and said, really? As in like, who? And she said, well, grandpa's, grandpa's mom had a brother that has Down syndrome. And Andrea and I looked at each other and thought, really? We've never heard anything about this before. Tell us more. We are all about everything Down syndrome. And we actually have a family member who has had Down syndrome and we didn't know about this. She said, absolutely. And she showed us a picture, beautiful, like very well done black and white picture of Andrea's grandmother great-grandmother, I should say, and her family. There was a number of siblings. There were like eight or nine siblings. And the youngest sibling in this family, this is like early 1900s picture, or the youngest sibling in this family clearly has Down syndrome. And we found out that his name is Evan. So immediately we had to learn everything that we possibly could about Evan. And we started to look at uh, family history, We actually found great aunt of Andrea who knew Evan, actually remembers Evan and uh, had experience with Evan. And so we um, spoke to as many different people as we possibly could about Evan, about what this was like back in the day, early 1900s. Here's what we found. We found that Evan, when he was born, 
and the diagnosis of Down syndrome came in, in, you know, at the time that it came, I think in the hospital that the hospital immediately said, we'll take this child and we will take them down to American Fork to the institution where these individuals were being institutionalized. And that's where he will be. And it wasn't even a question of, do you want this to transpire or how do you feel about this? It was just, this is what we're going to do. And the reason why is because that's what society did at that time. This is right here in the United States. This is in Utah, very family and for family oriented community, but this was just the accepted, the, the accepted practice of this. Andrea's grand, great grandparents, I get the family lineage off just a little bit, maybe. But anyways, Andrea's family, when they found this out, they said, absolutely not. Our boy's going to go home with us and we're going to raise him. And that was very, very different. That was against the norm at this point in time. At this point in time, there really wasn't a strong understanding of why individuals have Down syndrome or what this is exactly. There was actually a large fear that this is something that would be contagious this is something that could be passed on that if you're around an individual like this, you could have this, or you could pass this on to a child that has this. So it was a very, very fear-based, fear-based time in, in the life of, of individuals with special abilities. Andrea's family raised Evan and he continued to grow. Well, we found out that Evan was never allowed to go to school. Evan was never allowed to go to church. Very rarely would Evan even be able to go into society simply because of the perception and the way that people saw and treated them. And again, this is right here in the United States. This is, you know, less than a century ago that these experiences were transpiring. And in fact, you know, this had been transpiring long after Evan had, had gone. So his parents raised him. We found out that he loved to play on the piano. We learned that he would read. I mean, that he was actually a pretty high functioning kid. And that the kids, the, the kids, in fact, this firsthand account, I remember she said, I was afraid of Evan, but I don't know why. And so I was afraid of Evan, but I'm not exactly sure why, in essence, was the feeling that I got from her. But she said he was a very kind, like mild mannered kid just different than the rest of us. So fast forward throughout Evan's life, Evan's parents took care of him throughout his entire life. They got into their older age. They had him when they were older. Again, this is the youngest of many children in which they had. And they got to a place where they could no longer take care of Evan. And in fact, I believe one of the parents, if not the father had passed away, and that the mother was in a place where physically she was not able to care for her son. Evan was in his late 20s at this point in time. And when this transpired, Evan was then transferred to the institution, the adult institution that was in American Fork, which would be at that time about probably four hour or so drive, three hour drive. Uh, actually more close, like closer to four hour drive from Logan to get down here at that point in time. Evan stayed there for not very long. In less than a decade, he passed away. And uh, I actually saw a picture of Evan, you know, before institutionalization and then after. And it's shocking. Yeah, it's shocking. And that's not to say that he was mistreated or that this institute was uh, doing anything it be a will or, or a malpractice by any, any suit. I have no way of knowing that, nor do I believe that that was the case. More than anything, you have this boy, this child that is innocent, even in his 20s, as innocent as the day is long and probably loved his parents more than anything that lost his parents. And not only that, lost his family, lost his life and uh, had to go into this institution. So I share this with you. Because yes, we have come a long ways. Our children are now in homes and they're thriving and they're doing wonderful things. Yes, we have battles about inclusion at school and other circumstances that I've shared before, but we have come so far. We've come so far from the days of calling individuals with special abilities the R word. How 
crazy is that, that that was actually what we called them. Like not too long ago, I remember the campaigns to end the R word when Nash was a toddler. And so this is not very long ago that we had that. We've come a long ways overall, but we still have so far to go. We still have such a long ways to go. And may I submit to you that the reason why this is so important is not because these individuals need us. I would submit that this work is so important because we need these individuals. Our society needs these individuals. The world, our country as a whole, will benefit and be better off and realize our divine potential as a society, as a country, as a world, if we have more of this superpower, as I like to share it, or this special ability influencing us for good. Let me share a couple of experiences as to why I feel this is so important and what this superpower is exactly. My first experience that I remember experiencing this special ability, this superpower, actually came my senior year of high school. All throughout high school, I went to Preston High, as I shared. Proud Preston High alumni, class of 97, shout out. Here we go, Preston High. Super, super proud of that. Love, love my background in Preston. And so we were actually at uh, our senior assembly, my senior year of high school. And they were giving awards out at that senior assembly and giving awards and giving scholarships. And so all the kids that excelled in athletics, all the kids that excelled in education or leadership, these are the kids that have worked so hard and we all knew who they were and we all knew that they were going to be the ones getting the scholarships, getting the prizes, getting the awards, everything that day. It was a special time. It was great. Now, I want to share as well, those of you that that maybe knew me in high school would probably say the Brady Murray that we know today is very different than the Brady Murray that was in Preston High. My guess is there's a lot of us that can look back and say, yeah, I've evolved since the time of my high school days. But I was like many children, many youth, I would say. In fact, not so much today's day and age. These kids today are amazing. But I'd say back in the day, I was like your stereotypical kid. I was an athlete. I was a jock. I was very self-absorbed, very focused on everything about me and really, quite honestly, was not a great teammate in the sense of looking outward and trying to help other individuals. There was one classmate that I had, I remember in particular. So we were a small class. We was a class of maybe 100 people in our class. So we pretty much knew everybody in our class and knew them fairly well. I mean, we'd gone to school together for all these years and you get to know everybody. There was one classmate in particular. His name is Bo Walton. Still to this day, I consider Bo a dear friend and we're Facebook friends. I'd love to see updates from him, but Bo, if you're listening, shout out to you, brother. I love you. And uh, I'm so thankful for my association that I've had with you over the years. I would say, I actually think we're related in one way or another, if I'm not mistaken. And so shout out to my cousin, but, uh, Bo Walton was somebody that was entrusted with a special ability. I remember that Bo couldn't really use his left arm. He couldn't extend his left arm quite well. And Bo walked with a very pronounced limp and that, that was, that was Bo. Bo as well was one that worked so hard in school, but school just did not come naturally for him. And he had to work 10 times harder than the rest of us to be able to get a passing grade in his class. I remember clearly at, um, I remember like vividly, like it was yesterday, our freshman year of football, that Bo Walton came out and played football with us. He tried out for the team and he, he made the team. He was on the team. I remember Bo loved the Denver Broncos and he loved John Elway and he wanted to be a quarterback. And in fact, Bo with his, his good arm, his good hand could throw a football really, really well. I remember at practice, you'd have the first string and the second string and the third string, and then you'd have Bo and a couple of the other players that were down on the very end doing their own thing. And I remember Bo taking snaps and dropping back and throwing dimes to his, uh, to his receivers. Loved, loved seeing that. 
But Bo, by and large, operated in the shadows. Bo was not a popular kid. He was not a kid that was front and center by any means. He existed and we accepted Bo, but Bo really more than anything probably just existed within Preston High and the halls of Preston High. So at this senior assembly, I will never forget when they said that this next award, this next scholarship in May is going to an individual by the name of Bo Walton. And I remember all of us looking around and I remember clearly in my mind thinking, did they say that right? Was that right? Did I hear that right? And all of us kind of like applauded because that's what you're supposed to do, but not really. And we're all just processing what we just heard and trying to put two and two together. I remember Bo in this little auditorium stood up. He didn't know that this was happening. And he came forward and he walked down, limped down to the stairs where the stage was. And he walked up those stairs and then he turned onto the stage to be able to go and receive his scholarship. And he walked along that stage, and as he did so, we all saw in his eyes tears. And then these tears started to run down his face. And when we saw that, we started to cheer. And not only did we cheer, but we gave Bo a standing ovation that day. I remember he limped across the stage. He got to the place where he received this envelope that gave him the details of his scholarship. And he was just crying. And he turned to us and he lifted that above his head and he raised his head in that triumphant victory of a very, very special moment for a very special young man that was well-deserved. By this time, we were all screaming and we were cheering. And I remember many of us, myself included, were fighting back the tears. Here I am, you know, this tough high school senior that never, you know, would cry a day in his life, so to speak, and and uh, would never do that. I was just crying like a baby seeing my teammate, seeing my classmate be able to receive that scholarship that meant so much to him. And in that moment, here we are now, what is this, 30 years later, coming up on 30 years later, I still remember that. And I still remember Bo. And I still remember how I felt when I saw him receive that scholarship. And I saw the innocence and that look in his eye on how grateful and how thankful he was. And what I witnessed for the very first time in my life was what I would refer to as the special ability, as the superpower. Bo influenced me as an 18-year-old high schooler who was not in the mindset of being influenced in a way that has changed my life in a way that I still remember to this day. I remember I wanted to be my best self. I remember I wanted to be more kind to other people. I remember I wanted to stand up for the underdog and be a voice for the underdog. I remember I wanted to be like Bo. I wanted to be like Bo. And here he is, the least among us, the one who doesn't wear the the popular clothes, the one that's not scoring the touchdown in the football game, the one that just exists in the behind the scenes, was inspiring a student body because he had been entrusted with a special ability. And that special ability was now being put front and center on center stage to be able to inspire the hearts of the entire student body at Preston High that particular day. That is what I mean by we want to take special needs and turn those into special abilities. There are thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, there are millions of individuals in our country right now who have been entrusted with a special ability that if given the opportunity to be able to let that light shine in a similar fashion in which Bo Walton let his light shine in 1997, that's what changes hearts. That's what opens hearts. That's what softens hearts. That's what opens opportunities for individuals to be able to change. That's ultimately what changes nations in my mind. And that's what I believe we need more than anything right now is to be able to get that into the world. So, as I said, 
we need them much more than they need us, especially right now. I'm going to share one other experience with you, more recent experience, actually, that is also in a similar vein, but also extremely impactful to me. As I've shared, passion of mine and Andrea's is we love to be involved in the special abilities community through the miracle of adoption. And we started Rod's Heroes and came a 501c3 in 2013 and have since helped lots of kids that just need a shot to be able to get adopted, just need a shot to have a family, give them a, give them a, give them an opportunity to be able to put that superhero cape on and let their light shine. I've seen firsthand how these kids in orphanages and institutes are still have that light within them, yet it is confined and it is not impacting the world as it should. So last year in September, we went to Armenia. This was our first time ever going to Armenia. Was so excited to be able to go to Eastern Europe. Had never been there before and could not wait to be able to meet some of these children, these individuals, and do this work of advocating to help individuals with special abilities get adopted. As part of our work over there, we had the opportunity to go to an institution or an orphanage is probably a better way to describe it in Armenia. As we were over there, and, and in Eastern Europe, and in a lot of countries, but in Eastern Europe in particular, when a child is born with a disability or a special need, as they refer to it, a special ability, as I like to refer to it, they are placed in a baby house. And that's where they'll stay for typically four or five, maybe even upwards of six years of their life. The first four or five, six years of their life, they're in a baby house. They're being cared for there, and they're just existing there more than anything. At that point in time, these individuals are then transferred to an institution, to an orphanage. And this is not an institution for, you know, kids six to nine or six to 14 or whatever it may be. This is an institution for kids from age five or six indefinitely. So you have four or five and six-year-olds that are going to an institution and they're there with adults that are also have special, special needs or are disabled in that circumstance. So we got to visit one of these institutions and we've been to a number of these before. And I'll share with you, this one was very special. This was a wonderful, wonderful institution. In fact, many of these are not great environments. This was a special place. This was a good place. I remember the director had been there for 30 years as the director of this institution. And he had done so many wonderful things for them. He was taking us on a tour. It was a rather large campus, actually. It had so many outbuildings and then the housing and so forth where they were at and where the staff were at. But he was taking us on a tour and he took us to the very far reaches of the property. And there was an old building that he, I don't remember what it was before, but he had converted this into a place to do art. So all of the residents that are there in the institution have the opportunity to come and practice art and partake in different art projects. In particular, they really did a good job with clay making. And so they had a lot of clay that they were working with there and making pottery. When we walked down, it was hot. So it was really, it was really uh, sunny out. It was very hot. I remember I'm like, I'm getting sunburned. I can't see. And we go into this place. And the second that we go through those doors, it was actually really dark and had a dingy and almost dungeon like if you may as you go as you go walking in there but once you walk in you go into the main room it opens up and there we saw all of this pottery that was displayed on all of the shelves in bright colors just magnificent colors up there and then you saw all of the the pottery the raw materials that was there being worked on and right in the middle of all of that were three ladies that had special abilities and that were working their pottery. When we walked in, they immediately looked at us and their eyes just went bright as you can imagine. And they were so excited to see guests. They want, they immediately came up, they greeted us. I would guess that these, these individuals were in their early thirties, probably early to mid thirties is about the age that they were all about the same age, all three with varying different types of special abilities that they had and they couldn't wait to show us what they were working on for the next hour or so we sat there 
and watched them work and they helped us and taught us how to do it. And they took us around and showed us every single piece that they had, uh, that they had made. We asked them if we could buy it and they said, yes, we would love to buy it. And the director said, we, we actually do sell these and we use all this money to actually buy more pottery, more, uh, more materials for them to be able to continue on. So we picked out our favorite one and we made the purchase. We just got to know these beautiful individuals, just such a bright light about them. And I remember when we left, they left with us and they walked ahead of us and they were just walking arm in arm, three friends as happy as could be and living their best life in their, in their own minds. They were just very, very happy. And I remember in that moment thinking to myself, I'm so thankful that they're in a safe place. I'm thankful that they're being well cared for. I'm thankful that they are happy. But then I got sad and I thought to myself, ah, it's too late. It's too late for them to be adopted. They'll be here the rest of their lives. They've already aged out. The year in which individuals age out is 16 years old. So once 16 happens, the ability for somebody to be adopted at that point in time is just nil. They're zero. And so I was sad about that. I'm sad that they wouldn't have a family. That's the work that I'm super passionate about. But then something hit me, and this is what was the hardest part. And that was that these individuals made me want to be better. When I met them and after spending an hour with them, I left that room feeling better about everything. I was happy. I had light and joy inside of me. I wanted to be more patient. I wanted to be a better dad. I wanted to work harder on behalf of helping these kids get adopted and kids like them get adopted. I remember how much I loved my family just by being around these individuals. The, I remember actually feeling totally accepted, not judged. I could be my myself. I could be, and I, in fact, they brought out my best self in me, but I was never judged. I didn't feel like I needed to put on a certain facade or a face or act a certain way around these individuals. I wasn't trying to impress anybody because they accepted me for who I was. I accepted them for who they were, that we could be our best selves in that moment. And so I remember watching them walk away and feeling especially sad in this moment because that special ability that superpower that they have was going to stay in that institute for the rest of their lives and never be shared with the world. That's what I'm talking about. That's the idea of turning special needs into special abilities. And more importantly, the way we do that is to get that special ability out into the world. And I get it, parents and caretakers, that's a scary proposition. As I shared in our first episode, I was scared to death of Nash being hurt or failing or being bullied to being disappointed or just simply I felt like I needed to protect him. I was supposed to protect him. When in reality, the best thing that I can do to let Nash sing the song he's meant to sing, the best thing we can do to let our children sing the song they're meant to sing is to be able to get them into the world. Why? Because the world needs them. The world needs and deserves that special ability. That is my message today. Thanks for tuning in. Can't wait to continue on this journey. As always, if you enjoyed this episode, please share it. Also, we're very appreciative of those that are writing reviews and those that are um, giving us great reviews because it's through that that we're able to give this message to the world, inspire as many people as possible to turn special needs into special abilities. Until next time. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to this episode of Conquering Your Clownfish. If you liked what we discussed on the podcast today and want to continue the conversation, please visit us at conqueringyourclownfish.com. And please don't forget to subscribe.